Welcome to Solomon's Bookcase, Biblical Studies for the Critical Thinker, and a Theological Repair Kit for the Perceptive but Disillusioned Among Us. We're continuing our inaugural series on the Atonement of Christ, and today we're going to cover what's often referred to as the Ransom Model of Atonement. So I guess we should probably start with some kind of shared working definition of what, what do we mean by ransom? Well, you remember the movie Taken, right? This is where Liam Neeson's character is some kind of generic CIA field agent whose past clandestine action hero exploits are only, let's say, vaguely defined in the movie. But his character boasts of this, quote, particular set of skills that come into play when his daughter is kidnapped in France. Those of you that have seen the movie will remember this speech as the badass moment of the film when Liam has the kidnappers on the phone. Let's listen now. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Good luck. I know! Chills, right? And by the way, if you ever refer to something that you can do in life as part of your particular set of skills, you're either a dad or you're a middle manager. And in either case, you deserve every last eye roll that is guaranteed to be thrown your way. Now, the way most kidnap action thrillers would go at this point is that the kidnappers would demand a ransom. We have title some kind of obscene dollar amount to release the daughter back to her family. Now, Taken goes off in a slightly different direction. Turns out the kidnappers don't actually want ransom from a particular set of skills, Liam. But we'll conveniently ignore that for the expediency of my introduction. So how might this idea of a ransom pertain to Christ? Well, the ransom model of theology sees us, humans, as hostages of Satan. Okay? prisoners of a personified evil, and we are being held for, yeah, ransom. Well, along comes Jesus, and God in his love does not want us to be hostages to evil, but rather to be captivated by good. So what will it cost Jesus to ransom us away from Satan's grasp? And is Jesus playing fair in these negotiations, or is the briefcase actually full of counterfeit Chick-fil-A coupons? So if you're a fan of dubious analogies in your podcast, you've apparently come to the right place. Welcome to Episode 5, The Ransom Model of Atonement. Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record that Jesus heads up into the wilderness in the days following his baptism in the Jordan River. It's not so much that Jesus decides, well, I got that baptism thing out of the way. Time to burn up some vacation time in the hills. Rather, the text says that Jesus was led there by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is more of the passive party here. It's the Spirit of God, apparently, orchestrating this pilgrimage. Jesus fasts for 40 days, and according to Luke, when those days were ended, he was hungry. Yes, safe to say, 40 days of fasting, you're hungry. But as we'll see shortly in the story, that hunger is important for us to remember. So maybe we can forgive Luke, the physician, for dumbing things down for us a bit, right? And then some kind of evil personality manifests itself to Jesus at the end of this 40 days of starvation in the gravelly sands of the Judean hills. Now he's referred to as the devil, then the tempter, and then Satan, all in the same story. He goes by all these names. He might appear 
As a physical creature, he might appear as a disembodied voice or in a vision. You know, we just don't, we, all we know is that this figure shows up, right, in the, in the accounts. And he apparently doesn't waste any time. If you are the son of God, Satan says to him, command these stones to become bread. Treat yourself. The nature of this first temptation is that he's being tempted to supersede his humanity and use a superhuman method to get his needs met. Satan starts by going right for Jesus' most obvious deficiency. And notice this phrase that Satan uses, if you are the Son of God. Now, is he asking because he's taunting him? Or is he asking because he actually doesn't know, are you the Son of God? or not? This question is captured wonderfully, by the way, in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Some of you have probably seen that um, from several years ago, where Satan hears Jesus in the garden while he's praying to the Father, and Satan asks him, who is your father? Well, Jesus makes no response to this, so Satan follows up with, who are you? The implication there is that Satan genuinely doesn't know, or at least has significant doubt. Well, in answer to this first temptation, Jesus chooses instead to dwell on his humanity in his weakened state and to rely on the Father for his needs. So Jesus is modeling a human reliance upon God's provision. Jesus doesn't want to short-circuit his human experience. So Jesus refuses, quotes some scripture in response, man does not live by bread alone. Well, Satan tries again. He transports Jesus in what can only be some kind of a vision to the top of the temple's roof. And he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, something to point out here, the top of the temple and Jesus' audience would have, would have known this. Uh, the, the, the early audience of the Gospels would have known this. So it's something good to point out. The top of the temple is high. Yes, it's a tall building. But it isn't just the top of a large building. See, the temple itself sits on a larger platform, which is called the Temple Mount. And this extends, if you've been to Jerusalem, you're probably picturing exactly what I'm talking about here. The Temple Mount extends on a near sheer wall cliff above the valley below. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you can walk on the Temple Mount. The Muslim holy site of the Dome of the Rock uh, sits there. But you can stand at the edge of the mount and look straight down for a long way. So if Jesus were to jump off the temple, he's not just falling the height of a building. He's falling the height of a building plus a gigantic sheer cliff. So just for just so we can picture the scene here of what Satan's asking him to do. Well, the second temptation is the same as the first. Jesus relies on his humanity rather than resorting to a supernatural shortcut, as Satan suggests. Now, as opposed to the first temptation, the only reason why Jesus would follow through with this one would be to prove or show to the Satan figure that he is indeed divine. But it doesn't seem like Jesus is feeling the need to do so here. And he quotes another scripture in response. Do not put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Yeah, fair enough. We note here that the, um, as a side note, the order of these temptations is different in Matthew and Luke. We're, We're following the order of Matthew here. Luke reverses the second and third temptation. Um, Theologically, I don't, know that this makes a lot of difference. I I don't think that it does, but I point it out just to avoid any confusion if you're following along at home. According to Matthew's order of events, the third temptation has taken Jesus now up to the top of a very high mountain. So you notice we're going taller or higher each time in Matthew. And now we're at the top of a very high mountain for this third and final temptation. High enough so that all the nations and the kingdoms of the world can be seen instantaneously. We note that Satan is no longer prefacing his temptings with, if you are the son of God. But he says instead, to you 
I will give all this, this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I will. If you then worship me, it shall all be yours. It's like the, the showcase on The Price is Right. Sorry, I can't help but picture that. <laughs> What's behind the curtain? So Satan isn't being as coy. Um, his tone seems to have turned more forceful, you know, more insistent. Maybe you can feel that. Okay, so in ancient Near Eastern thought, the gods were thought to live and rule from the high places, the high mountains. You could uh, think of Moses ascending Mount Sinai to interact with Yahweh at the beginning of the Exodus out of Egypt. Or if you're familiar with the Ugaritic peoples who lived on the coast of Syria and Lebanon, uh, you're, you're thinking, yeah, right, Steve, everyone's familiar with the people of Ugarit. No? Well, let me explain then. Um, these are Canaanite people, or Canaanite-ish, if you want to be specific. Canaanite-ish peoples. They live on the coast, or would have lived on the coast of Syria and Lebanon. And uh, they believed, and we know this from preserved documents from, from their society, from their culture, they believed that Baal, or Baal, who is a god that is also mentioned in the Old Testament, but Baal lived at the top of Mount Saphon near the town of Ugarit. And it's from here, from Mount Saphon, that Baal would control the weather. He was known as a storm god. So thunder, lightning, rain, all of these things came from the power of Baal. The seasons themselves were thought to come from the power of Baal operating on the top of Mount Saphon. But, you know, we could give lots of examples of this from the ancient Near East. So for Satan to bring Jesus to a very high mountain, as the text says, and to start talking about the authority over the peoples of the earth, the authority um, over their fate, the gospel writers are informing us that this discussion is no longer about trivial matters. Okay, Hence Satan's more forceful demeanor. This discussion is taking place now in the realm of the gods. And somehow Satan has gained a position such that he has access to this domain. Satan is also doing something subtle here. There's another place in the scriptures where a deity lays the entirety of a land to be possessed out in front of the human figure. and Displays it in front of this person. Now those of you with some Old Testament knowledge, can you think where and who this might have involved. Who was the deity who laid out before the human figure the entirety of a land to be possessed? I'll give you a moment. Did you guess it? It's Yahweh and Moses. If you remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Yahweh has Moses climb Mount Nebo. And when he does so, Yahweh shows Moses the entirety of the promised land spread out before him. So I would ask this, is Satan attempting to imitate Yahweh here by displaying the promised land, in this case, the whole world's inhabitants and political authority? Is he attempting to imitate Yahweh by displaying all of this in front of Jesus? Kind of a callback to Yahweh and Moses? Well, I definitely think there's something to this idea especially given that the Satan figure is hungry for Jesus' worship of him. Satan wants what Yahweh has, and this is true throughout the New Testament, especially the Gospels. So the third temptation is thus. God's promised victory hasn't materialized. After all, the scriptures talk again and again about Yahweh's victories and his power, but yet people still suffer. Injustice continues to permeate humankind, and slaves still cry out for justice. Take charge of the situation, Jesus. Make it happen. Where the Father is impotent, I am able to deliver. Worship me, and your work here is done. And here's another thing, Jesus. We both know that the suffering that is coming for you. Take charge of the situation now, and there's no need to suffer. What are you doing? Why continue with this? Well, Jesus passes the final temptation by again coming back to Scripture. You shall worship only Yahweh your God, and him only shall you serve. 
Of course we know that Jesus is not going to succumb to Satan's temptations. But I think the authors, especially Luke, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, want us to remember that Jesus is fully relying on his human abilities here and is refusing to draw on his divinity. This being the case, we have to picture Jesus as frail, hungry, his resolve perhaps greatly weakened by 40 days of hunger. So could Jesus have failed these tests? Well, I don't think the story has much of an importance unless it was, in fact, a very real possibility that he could have failed. It's like one of those uh, Star Trek time travel scenarios, or Back to the Future, you could think of that. All kinds of uh, science fiction works have imagined what it would be like to go back in time and somehow toy with the past. You know, turn that one dial and see how things play out. Well, we could play with this idea. What if Jesus had failed this test? What happens to his divinity? What happens to his humanity? How does the Father respond to a member of the Trinity lapsing into human imperfections? And if asking these kinds of questions sounds heretical or dangerous to you, I understand. I understand that impulse, but I'd also say, as a response, ask yourself why it feels dangerous. I mean, is Jesus just a superhero that can do no wrong just because it's his default nature, because he's the hero of the story? Or did Jesus persevere through the risk of failure by the strength of his character and his submission to the Father? Do the gospel writers want us to think of Jesus as an unattainable superhero? I would say no. Or do they want us to think of him as a fully human, yet fully divine Jesus, Savior, who struggled as we struggle? Bingo, right? His success against a supernatural, harmful presence was gained completely through his human resolve and reliance on the Father. As Hebrews puts it, where Adam and Eve failed in their humanities to successfully resist the Satan figure, Jesus does indeed succeed. More central to our topic of the ransom model of atonement is the question of just what is Satan trying to get out of these temptations? I mean, why bother? Satan seems to be in a position of considerable power here, you know, taking Jesus to the realm of the gods and ultimately offering Jesus all the nations and kingdoms of the world. But we have to wonder, why would these be Satan's to offer in the first place? And look at the words that, that Luke has Satan tempting Jesus with here. To you I will give all these lands in their glory, because it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I want. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. That's from Luke chapter 4, verse 6. The Greek uses this word paradidumai, which you can interpret as a sort of handing over. Satan is saying that all the nations of the world have been Parodidomai, handed over to him, but by who and why? For what reason or purpose? And look, is he even telling the truth here? After all, this is the same being, the same Satan that Jesus later says about there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he just speaks according to his own nature, the father of lies. So why believe him anyway? Well, the theology which developed in an influential pocket of the early church was that Satan had in fact obtained what we could call legal rights over humanity as a consequence of sin. So Satan is taken at his word here, and and he did indeed hold the nations of the world and that authority, and they were his to give. Several of the church fathers held to this idea. Now, some did not, Um, Irenaeus viewed Satan as more of a pretender, 
seizing what was not his own, in his words. But Origen certainly did, and he views Satan as more legitimately holding a legal right to us. Here's what Origen says. If then we were bought with a price, as Paul asserts, we were doubtless bought from one whose servants we were, who also named what price he would have for releasing those who he held from his power. Now it was the devil that held us, to whose side we had been drawn away by our sin. He asked, therefore, as our price, the blood of Christ. So Origen sees us as having sold ourselves into slavery, giving the Satan, devil figure, the legal right to own our fate. We trade our fate to Satan in favor of the fleeting pleasures of sin. I think that would capture Origen's view here. Well, this trend in salvation theology continued among the early church fathers. Gregory of Nyssa says that not only did Satan own rights to us, but also that there was a ransom to be paid to Satan for our freedom. Satan is interested in making a deal for us. Satan doesn't want us as much as he is interested in the absolute power of God. And he would gladly exchange humans made in the image of God for the real thing. But in offering this ransom through the death of Jesus, God tricks Satan. And <laughs> got to explain that a little bit. So let's quote Gregory of Nyssa on this idea. How does God trick Satan in this ransom agreement? Remember earlier we talked about the briefcase that was possibly full of counterfeit Chick-fil-A coupons. Well, here's what Gregory says. In order to secure that the ransom in our behalf might be easily accepted by him who required it, the deity was hidden under the veil of our nature. That is, as with a ravenous fish, the hook of deity might be gulped down along with the bait of flesh. Okay, that's fantastic, but we probably need to explain that a little bit. Um, Satan here is a big, aggressive fish <laughs> out hunting for ultimate power, right? And Jesus appears to him as an easy catch, a smaller, more vulnerable fish. So Satan is lulled into a false victory, and he sees the human Jesus, perceives that the death of Jesus is no different from a human death, easily devoured. But the deity, the divine power of Jesus, was masked from Satan's view until it was too late, and Satan realizes his mistake. To kind of continue Gregory's fishing analogy, Satan takes the bait, and the hook of God's full authority and power now is revealed in the Jesus fish. <laughs> so the basis of the ransom model is that Satan held legal rights over all humanity in life and the afterlife due to the fall, original sin, and the inherited sin of all humans, which we need an episode about that, by the way. But God is able to deceive Satan when Jesus is given as a ransom sacrifice as an exchange for the life of all humans. Satan thought he would essentially become God or assume the powers of God by accepting the death of Jesus. But instead, he, re he realizes too late, his powers over us are in fact defeated because Jesus returns to full life and his resurrection robs Satan of whatever power and authority he thought he was getting. Now we need to note here that there's another very similar model which is called Christus Victor. And this model modifies ransom very slightly. Christ's death was not actually a ransom payment under Christus Victor, but it nevertheless defeats the powers of evil and Satan. The emphasis on Christus Victor is placed more on Christ's victory over sin. Victory over sin, death, and the evil forces represented by Satan. So the emphasis is more on the victory, less on this kind of business transaction approach of the exchanging of briefcases, the ransom taking place. This episode would not be complete without mentioning it, but I, I don't intend to spend much time on this variation. Um, it'll be enough for us today to talk about the ransom model. It'll kind of cover both. Um, but you'll, you'll sometimes hear the ransom model referred to as Christus Victor. So just want my audience to be aware that unless you're really digging into the nuances of these models... Um, they can be and often are considered equivalent understandings. So as we mentioned, the ransom model would be the majority view of atonement through Christ for the first thousand years of early church history. 
So it's worth us taking a few more minutes to examine it and critique it. And the way I'd like to do this is by way of the descriptions of Yahweh's power in the scriptures and how that power compares with the gods and powers of evil operating in the world. But why look at it this way? I mean, what does this show us? Well, that scene of the temptations of Jesus is clearly depicted as a power struggle, taking place in visions and among the high mountains of the gods. So is this something that Yahweh would have done, enter into a power struggle in the spiritual realm? Well, let's rewind the story back to the Old Testament and see how Yahweh conducts himself in the face of other supernatural entities. We could recall the Passover scene of Exodus 12 to start, where Yahweh says that he is going to attack the firstborn of Egypt. And he adds, On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment, for I am Yahweh. And after the Red Sea collapses on the army of Egypt, we see in Exodus chapter 15 the Israelites singing this victory song, Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. you got to just beat your chest and pound the war drum as you're saying this. Later in the same chapter, You will guide your people by your strength to your holy dwelling place. The nations will hear and tremble. It's an intoxicating blend of national pride and religious fervor for the Israelites, isn't it? It's a battle cry, a cry of victory. They are picturing Yahweh as their divine military commander. Now, this would not at all be uncommon in the ancient Near East. One of the names of Yahweh that's given is Yahweh Sabaov. Sometimes you'll see this translated in your English as the Lord of Hosts. But in modern language, it might be better understood, Yahweh, commander of the armies of heaven. In the account of Jericho, in the fall of Jericho, Joshua will encounter a man with a sword. Whose side are you on? Joshua will ask. Are you for us or against us? And the man, angel, God in human form, some people might think, we're not exactly sure the identity of this man, but he says, no, neither. But rather, I have come as the commander of the army of Yahweh. When King Sennacherib of Assyria threatens Jerusalem in 2 Kings chapter 19, the king of Judah, who is Hezekiah, has this prayer recorded. Amen, Yahweh, the kings of Assyria have decimated the other nations and their lands. They have cast their gods into the fire because they were not gods but rather the work of men's hands, just wood and stone. Well, truthfully, they were destroyed. So now, Yahweh, our God, please deliver us from his hand, such that all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you, Yahweh, are alone God. King Hezekiah does a couple really important things here. He insults Yahweh's divine enemies, saying that, in fact, they're not divine. They never were gods and thus were unable, clearly, to protect their people from the Assyrians. And then Hezekiah also declares, where these false gods failed, Yahweh will succeed. Yahweh alone is the divine military commander worthy of worship. So was Yahweh perceived in the Old Testament as doing battle with foreign gods, engaging in power struggles against these imposters? Yeah. Absolutely, he is. Now, our New Testament theology retains this imagery of Yahweh being a military commander, you know, challenging the gods of other nations in combat. But the focus shifts away from direct threats from other armies and nations and towards the spiritual powers that undergird, undergird rather, those nations. Jesus himself makes this clear in John 18, verse 36. He says, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over. But my kingship is not from this world. The people of Jerusalem are, of course, under what they consider to be political and military occupation by the Romans. 
So there is a substantial belief that their anticipated Messiah, their savior figure, should be a military commander, empowered by Yahweh to defeat Rome's power over them. But Jesus seems much more concerned with subversive power dynamics, doesn't he? He's playing the long game. Defeat of the spiritual power, the spiritual authority that makes this kind of oppression possible in the first place. But can we understand and sympathize with their expectations, the people of Jerusalem? I mean, isn't Yahweh depicted in the Old Testament as doing just this, delivering his people from oppression? I mean, isn't that part of the promise? Well, yes, but Jesus, again, being focused on the long game, seems to want to reframe these expectations. What was it that Yahweh was really doing? Yahweh isn't interested in worldly conquests. Rather, he's interested in combating the thing behind the thing, the thrust of spiritual evil behind the military and political oppression. Part of the reason why the the book of Revelation can be just so confusing and confounding to read is that it concerns itself with these spiritual underpinnings and is thus much more abstract than a straightforward military campaign. I mean, it... It's depicting a spiritual battle. I mean, let's look at Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay, fun fact, no one understands the book of Revelation. No one. Okay, that's a lie. Some very knowledgeable people, actually a lot of knowledgeable people, study Revelation and get great insights from it turn around and teach the rest of us. I just said that because it sounded funny. It's my podcast. I can do stuff like that. The only takeaway for us today from a passage like this is that we're talking about power. We're talking about supernatural authority. And these things are being used in Revelation against the Lamb, against Christ, even as these powers were ultimately failed or are coming up against the Lamb. That title, King of Kings, this originated as an Assyrian term. So go back to the Old Testament. To refer to the supreme ruler over all the territories and all the provinces in Assyria. That's where this title comes from. Jesus doesn't use this title for himself ever while he's alive on earth, King of Kings. But he is assigned this title in 1 Timothy and Revelation. Jesus is now... By being assigned this term, Jesus is now being identified as a ruler coming in glory. In Revelation, he returns on a white horse. You know, it's all this warfare imagery, right? But his warfare is, of course, now against these spiritual forces. I mean, having covered what we just covered, just listen to the language used in Revelation chapter 19 for the return of Jesus in victory. And look for the Look for the themes of warfare. Look for the themes of ancient Near Eastern victory that permeate through a passage like this. I saw heaven open, and look there, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And his armies, which were in heaven, followed him on white horses clothed in fine linen. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it he should strike down the nations. And he has on his robe and thigh a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it's undeniably warlike imagery. Just as Yahweh is viewed as an executor of judgment and as a liberator in the Old Testament, well now so is Jesus viewed in the New Testament, as he returns in glory. But while the Old Testament battles against evil and powerful nations is in the more traditional physical warfare sense, the New Testament establishes that these battles against evil, to cite Joel Green's interpretation, are fought and won by adopting the way of the Lamb, 
being witnesses to the truth of God, even at the cost of one's life. The king of kings is no longer concerned with the physical defeat of armies, but now the defeat of the powers and principalities that are the true threat. So the partnership between God and God's people continues in this ransom model. God breaks the legal authority of evil and Satan through the crucifixion and resurrection, and people continue to push against the remnants of this evil by participation in God's ethic and work while alive on earth. Okay, let's sum up this position. By Jesus' day, evil in the person of Satan is viewed as having a legal right over creation, and thus the world system serves evil purposes because of its rulership by Satan. These are the powers and principalities that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 6-12. Let me read that for you now. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Under the ransom model, salvation is deliverance from Satan, and Jesus in his divinity is able to achieve this deliverance. Greg Boyd views this as a cosmic significance. We as individuals are set free because God conquers the powers of the world and the strong man is bound. Quote there. Our personal and social victories participate in Christ's cosmic victory. The initial victory of Christ was as bait. Remember Gregory of Nyssa's fishing metaphor? As Christ's true nature was both fully human and fully divine, sinless, Satan's power could not stand up against Christ's power. And thus Jesus was spewed out of hell on the third day. Recall that Jonah here is a metaphor that Jesus himself uses. And when Jesus is spewed out, returned to life, all of captive humanity comes with him. So to wrap up this episode, I thought we would go through a brief critique of this model, both positive and negative. As Jesus is hanging on the pole, on public display, as we've talked about, an object of shame and disgrace, in the background, there is a cosmic bargain at play. Under this model, Satan and death get to swallow up Jesus, and in exchange, humanity will be set free from Satan's authority. Jesus suffers and dies a humiliating human death as a ransom for us all, even as he knows that this ransom agreement has been a trick all along. Now, as Mark Baker and Joel Green state, in this model, Jesus' obedience and sinless work on earth is the key to his saving work. So this makes sense, then, why the satanic strategy of killing him just after birth might actually have worked. If we kill Jesus as an infant, the ransom exchange can't ever take place, right? And Satan remains in control of humanity and of the world. So under the ransom model, the entire salvation plan would have fallen apart if Jesus is, is killed as a baby. It's, it's that fascinating hypothetical that we've been tossing around. Now, critique of this ransom model is the evil doesn't really look to be defeated in the world, even after this exchange takes place 2,000-some years later, right? And evil's power still seems very much unbroken. So we think back to the temptation that Satan tempts Jesus with a quick way to regain all the authority of the world, takes him up to the high place, takes him up to the realm of the divine, offers him a way to short-circuit the impending victory of God. But if we were frustrated 2,000 years ago that evil is still very much operating and present in the world, well, what about today? I mean, is today really any different? At least to our powers of observation. Are the powers of Satan and these evil forces really in any way observationally reduced in strength compared to before the resurrection? What shape does this victory take if it's not evident in our day-to-day -day experience or through history? You know, Satan seems to have been making a fair point in his third temptation. If God has promised to bring victory into the injustice of the world, well, why is it still very much present? Why does God's justice continue to look to be so powerless in the face of human evil? Now, there are some very good responses to that question. 
Remember, Jesus is in this for the long game. But it's a critique that certainly has to be reckoned with, and that's why I bring it up here. What do we do with a world still apparently full of evil spiritual forces when we also consider Jesus to be victorious? And we also need to contrast this model with the penal substitution model from our previous episodes. If you recall that a key attribute of the Romans' road is this substitution, substitutionary aspect. The New Testament makes it clear, I, I would say, that Jesus does serve as a substitute for us in, in some capacity. Greg Boyd sees Jesus bearing our sin and guilt under Christus Victor by voluntarily experiencing the full force of the rebel kingdom we have allowed to reign on the earth. As opposed to the penal substitution model, though, it's not that God's wrath and punishment have been transferred onto Jesus, but rather it's evil as a spiritual force which receives God's wrath and attention, not us. As the church father Origen says, To whom was the ransom paid? Well, certainly not to God. Can it then be to the evil one? For he had power over us until the ransom given to him on our behalf, namely the life of Jesus, and he was deceived, thinking that he could keep his soul in his power. So the ransom isn't to satisfy God's wrath. It's rather to free us from evil powers that we subjected ourselves to. Another critique of this model is the lack of urgency on our part regarding our sin, as well as participating in God's good work. If we've been freed from all these evil forces and that work has been completed, well then what incentive do we have remaining as people to participate in God's continuing work here on earth? I I personally think that's kind of a a weak critique, as the ransom model itself stipulates that we, we must continue participating in this victory until the end of human history. But it's a fair critique, and one that still needs to be addressed. The elephant in the podcast, of course, the elephant in the episode, anyway, is that Ransom really heavily, heavily depends on a personified evil. And Satan behaves very much as a rational actor in these negotiations. So we really do have to grapple with the character of Satan to make this model make sense. If a Ransom is going to be paid to Satan, then he has to be understood as a personality with free agency more literal than figurative. In a future episode on the nature of spiritual beings like Satan, I would love to do that episode for you in the future because it's something we need to talk about. Um, how seriously are we really taking you know, Satan and the demons and the angels and all these, and all these heavenly creatures? Um, this model really depends on Satan being a rational actor, so we have to reconcile that. We already brought up the troubling idea that Satan somehow has gained authority over humanity, over the earth. When Jesus appears to the disciples in Galilee after his resurrection, notice what happens. Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So where is Jesus when he says this? Did you catch it? Yeah, he's on a mountain. This is where the gods would rule. This is where the gods would issue their commands over their people. So this makes sense that Jesus would call his disciples to a mountain and he would be there. Jesus now has come into his rightful authority. And so he occupies the divine realm. But again, who gave it to him? Was it Satan's to give, as he claimed? Or did the Father have them the entire time to give to Jesus at his victory? It's a question that is unclear. Although the takeaway, the takeaway for me is Jesus has the authority. At the end of Matthew, the end of the gospel account, it is Jesus who speaks from the high mountain, not Satan. Jesus has reclaimed or has been given his rightful authority. And that, of course, when we look to the the end of the New Testament and the book of Revelation, is the scenario that we see playing out. Jesus, in his full authority, returns 
to earth to rule. So I've mentioned several times now that this model for understanding atonement and salvation was a prominent model for understanding this in the early church. So what happened to change that? Well, in the medieval period, two influential theologians put forth significant challenges to this supposed exchange of powers between Jesus and Satan. Anselm of Canterbury, as one of them, could not understand why we as people would have actually sworn an allegiance to the devil. Instead, he saw our obligation to God himself. We we dishonored God by our sin. And so it's to God that we should owe that restitution. Satan doesn't really play into that equation after all, except as maybe the source of our temptations. But why would we owe Satan anything? We don't. We owe God. So we'll talk about Anselm of Canterbury. And meanwhile, the other theologian, Peter Abelard, well, he couldn't understand why Christ dying on the cross would release humans from captivity anyway. I mean, how does that work? Why is this even necessary? It's the question that we began this series by asking. Why not just defeat Satan outright? God. (laughs) I mean, wouldn't Satan have needed permission from God to take ownership of humans, which Of course, he presumably wouldn't get. So we'll dig into these two theologians next time and and the implications of their questions. Uh, They're very good questions. But we're not going to get bogged down in the nuances of these two personalities and the theology they put forward. I I, want to kind of more skim the surface of the massive change in the atonement theology that these two theologians introduced. So I want to focus a little bit more on that We'll spend a few minutes with uh, Peter Abelard and Anselm of Canterbury and and what came to be known through their work as the satisfaction model, which is the precursor in many ways to the Romans road and to the the way that we think of atonement commonly today. And we'll also see, um, if you'll allow me to pull back the curtain just a little bit on where we're heading, after we cover the satisfaction model and we'll skim a couple more models just in brief, Um, We we will also sketch out the modern-day Roman Catholic perspective of the atonement of Christ, which might contain some surprises if you're not familiar with it. Or for my listeners, and I know there's a few who grew up Roman Catholic or have significant Roman Catholic background, it it might surprise you. I actually have been uh, learning some, some new things that I did not know growing up Catholic about the theology that I was taught. So hopefully there's some interesting uh, nuggets in there for you. And then in our final episode, in our series on the atonement, which I promise you we are, we are actually full speed ahead getting to, <laughs> we will summarize the ground that we've covered so far, and um, we'll chart a possible way forward. So stay tuned for that. Solomon's Bookcase is independently researched and produced. Please support us by recommending this to the theologically or biblically nerdy or just inclined individuals in your Christmas cards this year. Or drop a link to your critically thinking friends. We'll see you early in 2020 for our next episode on the Atonement of Christ. And if I can get the audio recorded before skipping town, I'm going to try and get you a Christmas episode. So watch uh, watch for that in your feed in the next week or so. Thank you for listening. It means a lot to put this out into the community and to hear your feedback and appreciation. Thanks very much. Have a blessed Advent season.